So welcome to the call. Um, I'm Dr. Melanie Barham, and I'll be facilitating, facilitating the call and the co-chair of the Equestrian Canada Health and Welfare Committee. Um, so if you can, if you are not speaking today, if you can... Uh, Have joined the conference. Star six. Again, star six to mute your line if you are not a speaker. That would be great. Um, and we will get started in a couple of minutes. I'm just going to wait for everyone to, to come on, on the line so we don't hear a, a ton of beeping in, in their first updates. John Savard. Has joined the conference. Hmm. So to give an introduction to everybody on the line, what the purpose of this call is, is to share nationally uh, information about equine health and welfare um, with stakeholders throughout the equine industry. Uh, it is an open call, so anybody can join the line uh, who is interested uh, in, in knowing more about the equine industry. So do bear that in mind. The calls are also recorded, and we will be posting these online on the Equestrian Canada website, the audio recording. And for that reason, we do ask that you hold questions until the end so that we can, um, if you're uncomfortable with having Has joined the conference um, on the recording, then we can edit them out at the end. Um, if you wish to share this notice with other people or wish to get on the mailing list for it, um, Pam Cover has the, joined the conference. Christy House is the person to email at khouse at equestrian.ca. Um, if you are not speaking, if you can mute your line by pressing star six, that would be great. And it's star six to unmute at the end when we have Linda questions. Linda Bedard, Tenebred Canada. Has joined the conference. Okay. So our first speaker um, is, um, is from, Can from the Canadian Animal Health Surveillance System, Dr. Keith Mertz. Uh, Keith, I'd like to invite you to go ahead and give, give the EHSN update. Okay. Thank you, Melanie. Um, Has joined the conference. The Has joined the conference. The activities of the CAS coordinating team has been focused on um, uh, working towards having the coordination and uh, activities moved out of primary CFIA and, and agriculture over to the National Farmed Animal Health and Welfare Council. We had a workshop in Toronto early May with uh, uh, CAS directors uh, working group and the council working group and then we have a larger meeting coming up on June 13th but this next week with the entire um, directors and the council group and it's a work one day workshop and, and an effort to work out the details on, on moving the CAS coordination over to the council and there's been numerous conference calls and meetings and documents preparations for for this upcoming meeting and, and as we go forward. So nothing very specific to the um, equine network, but it will affect them uh, as we move forward. Hillary has joined the conference. Thank you, Melanie. Okay, thank you very much, Keith. Um, okay, so we will move on. Um, so we'll move on to my update from the uh, Equestrian Canada uh, Health and Welfare Committee. So I'm Dr. Melanie Barham. Um, I'm one of the co-chairs of the committee. Uh, to give you an update, um, we're finalizing two new rules that will be available for comment after June 30th, 2018. The two rules revolve around uh, veterinarians on call at EC sanctioned shows and also around vaccination requirements for horses at sanctioned shows. Um, to give a little bit of information, the first rule uh, about veterinarians at Equestrian Canada sanctioned shows um, is a slight modification from the current rule, which does require that sanctioned shows have a veterinarian um, on call. And it just asks that, that the um, show has a written agreement with a veterinarian um, who can be on call for the show and agrees so that there it, um, doesn't, and that it would be furnished upon request to Equestrian Canada. The second rule uh, will have a little bit more ramification and following um, review of other jurisdictions such as the United States and other areas uh, around the world, um, as well as looking at disease outbreaks over the past couple of years, the committee has uh, put forward a rule that will ask that stabled horses at, at an EC sanction event be vaccinated for equine herpes virus and equine influenza within six months of the event. Um, Again, this is just for stabled horses, so horses that are shipping in um, and 
to being at events but not staying, but horses who are stabled, um, it would be upon the school states that it would be upon the owners, it would be upon request that the, that proof be furnished. So exact wording will be available when the rules have become available for comment, and we're happy to take questions at the end of the call for that. Um, several disease outbreaks have been reported by Equestrian Canada's health alert, um, both EIA and Strangles, and we have been working with CAS, the Equine Health Surveillance Network, on this initiative, and we'd like to continue to provide accurate and timely information to our stakeholders across Canada. So if you are in a province, if you are in Canada and you have a disease outbreak in your province, we would like to encourage you to consider bringing it forward to either to CAS or to, um, or to Equestrian Canada so that we can put that information out there to help, um, to help reduce the amount of pandemonium then and worry that happens when we have disease outbreaks. Most of the time, <clears throat> it seems to be more about making informed decisions and making sure that your horses are protected rather than <clears throat> rather than panicking. So we'd like to be able to provide that information if you can. Um, so if you can bear that in mind next time you have um, next time you have an outbreak. And we also have Nicole Wanamaker on the line today from um, from New Brunswick, who's going to be giving an update about the outbreak that's happened uh, happened in that province. Um, just to bring to light. Uh, the new equine infectious anemia proposal for increased testing in horses is up for consultation. And I would strongly encourage every uh, stakeholder to take a look at it and comment. We will put a link to that with the recording to the call. And it was sent out to all Equestrian Canada stakeholders um, in an e-blast. I think it was just yesterday. Um, the increase in number of cases has prompted these proposed changes. And an EIA working group, um, several of whom are members of the Health and Welfare Committee, have been working on um, have been working on this issue with CFIA for the past couple of years. Um, additionally, um, we are working on a gap analysis of areas of concern uh, revolving around welfare within the equine industry. If you wish to contribute, um, please contact Christy House at khouse at equestrian.ca. Um, we're happy. What the what the um, Health and Welfare Committee is doing is inviting interested parties to come in and discuss areas of concern. Um, Has joined the gaps, conference so that we can create not necessarily to target particular areas of an in, of the industry, but to say where are the similarities and where are the broad um, where are the broad issues that exist, so that we can take a, a more informed approach and and be a bit more proactive as opposed to reactive in our approach to uh, equine welfare. Other initiatives we're collaborating with with other areas of Equestrian Canada include uh, the National ID proposal um, for traceability and has joined the conference. A proposal for a new industry and economic impact study in the Canadian horse industry, and emergency action plan training for horse owners and event operators. And that concludes my portion of the uh, my update. So I'd like to ask um, Jean Scott Nicky to provide an update on veterinary drug fees. Um, Jean Jean is from uh, CAHI, the Canadian Animal Health Institute. Is that right? Yes, it is. Um, Good, I'm glad I got that right. <laughs> um, so we asked Jean to come on because there was, um, there has been some discussion online about the increase in drug prices for horses, um, and Jean would be the resident expert on this. So um, we're very pleased to have her here with us today. Okay, um, I'm glad to be on the call, and thank you for inviting me to participate. Um, Health Canada now, under ministerial order, can increase fees, and they have made a decision to increase fees to, co to cover the cost of the service for any activity they do within Health Canada, whether it be human or veterinary drug related, it can also be medical devices, et cetera. Um, in the case of veterinary drugs. Um, if somebody, there's, uh, we can hear a lot of background noise, so if somebody, if you're not speaking, if you could press star six on your line, that would be great. So in the case of veterinary drugs, um, there was a notice that came out in October of 2017 that said they, that proposed an increase to, um, in the fees so that 75% um, of the cost of delivering the service would be introduced in year one, 
starting in 2019, and 90% of the cost of delivering the service would be introduced by in year two, so 2020. Um, for veterinary drugs, uh, we certainly went forward and did an analysis of what, what does that mean um, to our member companies, and I represent the manufacturers and distributors of all animal medications in Canada, or the medi for my members, which is 95% of sales. And our analysis indicated that um, a, a product would have to have a minimum of five hundred to eight hundred thousand dollars in annual sales to be able to support the reg the new increases in regulatory costs. So we have gone back to the government and said um, these kind of fee increases would mean that we would lose about eighty to ninety percent of our products. And, and yes, we might not lose them all. Some of the costs, the additional costs of regulatory, may be added on to the price of a product, but in a lot of cases, I think we would actually lose um, some of the small niche products, and, and um, we would also see a, a number of new products not in, enter into the Canadian marketplace, and, and again, our estimate was 80 to 90 percent of products, and remember, we don't have as elastic the same elasticity in pricing that the human the human side of the industry has subsidized drug costs, and as well the options of um, not treating going to an alternative drug if one is available um, or euthanizing the animals are options that don't necessarily have a, as as much um, activity on the human side. Last week, uh, or two weeks ago, Health Canada has come back with a revised proposal, and the revised proposal is that they they would have fees set fees at 50% of the cost of delivering the service, and that would be introduced over a seven-year period. Um, small to medium size enterprises, which are firms that earn less than five million a year or have less than a hundred employees, would actually have a fifty percent reduction in the service fees. Now, there is a part about affiliates that I have to get sorted out, but it would seem that if a company is part of an international or or North American affiliate, those Affiliates would also be covered, be considered in the sales and the and the actual number the part of that equation. But in our case, in our analysis, we showed that nine of our members have sales of less than five million a year, and we have 20 members that have licensed product to sell in the Canadian marketplace. And of our 20 members, only one company has more than 100 employees. So very much the, the um, animal health industry is really considered a small to medium-sized enterprise. So at this point, um, because we just got the, the documentation, we're reviewing it and, and looking at the implications, it, it's certainly better than where we were at in the October proposal, but it certainly still increases that may impact uh, small market products. And I'd, once we have the, our analysis completed, I'd more, be more than welcome to, to share it with the other organizations. I, I think I'll end there unless there's any questions. Okay, um, and we will just hold calls or questions until the end, but um, that's great. Thank you very much, Jean. Um, so next we have uh, joining us Shauna Curran Cooper, who is from the Equestrian Canada Medications Committee. So, Shauna, if you could give us an update from meds, that would be great. Um, thank you, uh, Dr. Uzafi couldn't be present on the call today, so I'm going to fill in here. Um, nothing life changing. We are uh, we've been testing at the shows at all levels since March, and testing is going well. Um, deceptive from the membership, and um, seems that education is getting better, which is great. Uh, compliance from competitors has been good. No reported issues during the medication testing. 
Um, the other thing that we've been successful at this year is implementing the new FBI testing kits and testing protocol. Uh, they've switched everyone over to the European kits, so we did uh, training with the FBI testing technicians, and I've done up uh, some educational pieces as well and been communicating with the both the technicians and our FBI vets, and it's, it's gone really smoothly considering uh, the changeover. And uh, the other thing that we did is we had the technicians from across Canada fly into Toronto back in March for an in-person uh, seminar. So that was really good because we were able to standardize and harmonize the testing procedure so that it's um, trying to get it more um, standard across the country so that if you have a testing experience in one province, it will be similar if you bring your course to uh, another province. Uh, other than that, that's really about it. Um, Has joined the conference. If you have any questions, uh, you can email equinemed at equestrian.ca as well. So I'll give you that email. Okay, thank, thank you very much. Um, Okay, if you're not speaking, if you're not a speaker on the call, if you can press star six to mute your line, it would be greatly appreciated. We're still getting some background noise. Um, and the next person on our call is um, Dr. Nicole Wanamaker, who's from New Brunswick, uh, from the uh, provincial government, and she's going to be updating us on the Spangles outbreak that occurred. Thank you. So greetings from the East Coast, and I am Nicole Wanamaker, manager of the Provincial Veterinary Service which falls under the Department of Agriculture here in New Brunswick. And uh, I thank you guys for the invitation to join your call today and your interest as well in Strangles and its presence in New Brunswick. We actually have had cases in all three maritime provinces, Prince Edward Island, Nova Scotia, and New Brunswick, within the last six weeks or so. It's not surprising since we're so closely knit geographically and equine traffic does flow in and out of all three provinces quite regularly. So what I thought I'd do in today's talk, since we have um, a mixed audience, is I would just briefly give an overview of the agent that causes strangles, clinical signs, and the cases here in New Brunswick, along with the diagnosis, treatment, prevention, biosecurity measures, and then some, a few lessons that we've learned along the way. So as you know, bacteria uh, called strep equi is the uh, cause for strangles in horses, donkeys, and mules. It's highly contagious, and it's spread either by direct contact nose-to-nose -nose, or by indirect contact through hands, clothes, footwear, shared feeding troughs, and feed tubs. The incubation period of the bacterium is around three to four days, and usually the first sign of the strangles appears as a fever, and then within 24 to 48 hours after that fever, there's usually a thick nasal discharge. The horse becomes depressed, lethargic, and has a cough. And eventually there's a lymph node enlargement and abscesses that can occur. Uh, you'll get enlarged lymph nodes underneath the lower jaw or the retropharyngeal lymph node enlargement, which is near the throat latch, making it hard for the horse to chew or swallow. Now, in New Brunswick, in our backyard, we have three laboratory-confirmed cases of strangles, which means that the samples taken by the attending veterinarians have gone on to have positive cultures for the bacterium Streptococcus equi. And our situation in New Brunswick started on May the 9th when we received a call in our, our office about coughing horses with nasal discharges and swollen lymph nodes. I'll uh, describe the barn as being barn A, where the call came from, and it's about 20 kilometers from our office. And my office is located here in the southern part of New Brunswick near the Bay of Funday. And it's funny enough that just a couple of days prior to the call, I actually had seen a posting on the government of Prince Edward Island's website regarding an advisory about strangles, and that strangles had showed up in their province in Charlottetown, which is about a two and a half hour drive from my office here in Sussex. So in Barn A, where my colleague went, uh, there's about 20 horses ranging in age there from eight months to 17 years, so a couple of youngsters. The barn is one of the uh, 
It has one of the biggest indoor arenas around and hosts many clinics. So they are open quite regularly for training, and they also have a small tack shop that brings horse enthusiasts in. Five horses were examined that day and nasal swabs were taken, and one horse had a confirmed positive strangled diagnosis, and that was our first case. Then about two weeks later, Barn B, I'll call it that, located about 50 kilometers south from our office, was the source of our second confirmed case. Now, this is a barn that has 15 horses, ranging in age from three years to 20-plus years. They're quite old there. And um, this actually was a positive case from a horse that was recently, recently purchased, and she actually was in isolation at this barn. She uh, has a history of coming from a stable about 30 minutes from the main New Brunswick border. Other than that, there's no other history. Unfortunately, Barn B is open to the public. They're located in the city limits of St. John, and they offer wagon rides, pony rides, and trail rides to the public. And so people of all sorts will come there to visit the horses, have a picnic, and play in a park nearby. Three days later, Barn C was a source of our third confirmed case, and this barn is located about 50 kilometers north of our office. This barn is quite small, one owner, has four horses that range in age from 7 to 19, and uh, unfortunately one of those horses had been off the property to a clinic at a stable where Strangles was eventually diagnosed. So the diagnosis was made by the veterinarians attending the calls, taking nasal swabs or swabs from draining abscesses, and they're sent to our provincial laboratory in Fredericton, we send all our samples there for processing, and what can't be done in our laboratory is then sent off to other labs across the country. As far as treatment goes, the attending veterinarians gave patients antibiotics, penicillin, or um, oral trimethoprim sulfa tablets, bute, banamine for pain and um, fever, and then, of course, supportive care. On these three farms, vaccinations were not used. But in our practice area, we've had a lot of requests for talking about strangles since then and the associated vaccine that goes with it. So here in our um, practice, we use Pinnacle by Zoetis, and we've been using the labeled uh, recommended directions, a boost, or a first dose and then a booster two to three weeks later to naive horses. Um, other little things we're doing is that if there's any dental work, teeth extractions to be done, the horses are not getting the strangles vaccine during that visit, um, just for concerns of it being a modified live bacterium and just the worry about possibly infections or complications. In looking at the disease, a natural infection, it seems that horses will uh, mount an immunity for up to five years as long as other aspects of the horse's health are and welfare are taken care of. So in these three barns, there might be some natural immunity that's going to go on um, after it's said and done. So, so finally, the biosecurity measures that the veterinarians are recommending is, of course, to isolate the sick horses as soon as they're found. However, um, I know one veterinarian was talking that if she found a sick horse in a paddock with a group of other horses not showing signs, it might be likely that those horses not showing signs may either become sick or are carriers. So she was recommending leading the horses as a group, don't switch paddocks, and only move the sick horse into isolation stalls if it was needed. The horses, of course, are being checked with uh, twice daily uh, by taking their temperatures, and the visitor restriction is placed on the barn. There's also a no movement policy so horses cannot move on or off the premises. And if the veterinarian is suspicious of strangles, then definitely that is um, immediately initiated, the no movement policy, until lab results come back. Other things we're telling owners are to wash their hands, wear disposable gloves if needed, be aware of their clothes and footwear, don't share grooming tools, don't share water buckets, feeding troughs, and if they're moving a horse out of quarantine and back into the herd, the attending veterinarians are following a policy of 
having three nasal swabs done about seven days apart, and all three have to be negative. Finally, I guess the lessons learned. Um, first of all, I have to say our laboratory in Fredericton has been wonderful, but they've been very overwhelmed with samples. So to speed up the process, we've recommended that veterinarians working on strangle cases who only want to detect strangles on nasal swabs or abscess swabs put that on their requisition because it speeds up the process so the lab techs aren't filtering through all the background organisms, and that's really helped with the turnaround of results. Strangles also is not a reportable disease in New Brunswick, and um, so with that in mind, I've had some people asking about that because they're very curious and wondering about strangles, and currently it's not high, I don't think, on the priority list of legislators. But as I said, it has been discussed quite frequently by horse owners who would like to know more about it and where it is and how they can deal with it in their backyard. They also want to make sure that the disease stays put and that uh, the healthy herd of New Brunswick is maintained. Some other things I've noticed um, or have learned is this premise ID. We, uh, we were discussing that with CFA biosecurity website that the Equestrian Canada had posted. And currently, premise ID in New Brunswick is only looked at in the food animal sector, swine, poultry, dairy, and beef. So um, there might be some interest there from horse owners, but we'll see what happens as, uh, as things transpire with this outbreak. Another thing to be learned was being proactive. I was quite happy to see PEI with their advisory and wanted to follow suit with our own advisory because I thought it was important to let New Brunswick equestrian um, stakeholders know exactly what was going on and to keep communication open, both for the stakeholders and also, too, for the veterinarians, because we have provincial vets and we also have some private veterinarians in the southern part of the province who um, wouldn't interact with us, and so it's nice that if everybody is on the same page and knows what's going on. I guess the final thing I learned was once the advisories go out, there is that potential for media inquiries, which has been very interesting. And it's nice to see that they're very keen to carry the story and find out about strangles. They're um, very persistent on trying to get locations of cases, but of course with patient, client, veterinarian confidentiality, that can't be released. But um, anyways, they're very um, keen to ask questions like, is it reportable in Brunswick? And if not, how do I know about the cases? And um, of course, the typical things like, what are the signs? How can you prevent it? Where can you get more information? Of which uh, we answer all of those questions and then, of course, resort to uh, telling them to go to Equine Canada or um, the American Association of Equine Practitioners, different things different areas where they could find information. And finally, they've always asked if any horses died yet and things about the vaccine. So that's our cases in a nutshell. So far, as I said, I've got three with some swabs pending confirmation, which I probably won't know till the end of the week. So there might be more than three cases that I'll be talking about here shortly. Thank you for your time. Okay, thank you very much, Nicole, for that um, for that update. Um, <clears throat> so I'd like to open the line now for questions, if there are any. Um, so if, if you would like to unmute your line, uh, do so with star six. Um, Melanie, this is Wayne Burwash. Uh, do you want to take each um, topic separately oh, and amazing. have uh, questions on each, and then? Uh, uh, take them one by one because uh, I don't know if I'm alone, but uh, I've got questions on four different topics. Okay, good. All right. Um, okay, so let's do uh, the CAS update first. So from Dr. Merch on the Equine Health Surveillance Network, if there are any questions for Keith. Okay, Keith, you might be off the hook. Oh, great. <laughs> <laughs> oh, okay. Um, Thank you. For the health and welfare update, any questions for myself? Uh, Melanie, you might mention uh, when uh, Nicole talked about premise ID that mm -hmm. uh, the um, uh, Equestrian Canada is uh, really promoting that across the country, and there are some provinces 
already that have it well in place and uh that, uh, for sure, I would uh, be a strong advocate of New Brunswick uh, uh, kind of implementing uh, some kind of premise ID or well yeah. across the whole country. Excellent point. Yeah, so premises ID, for those who are not uh, aware, is a unique number that a farm is assigned. So anywhere that livestock is held, depending on what you have. Um, it's usually really fast to get one, and most government organizations across every province across Canada has the ability to get one through your province. And it actually has been really, really useful during outbreaks and during things like flooding, um, wildfires, and other natural disasters. Uh, they've been able to notify the sector fast, um, very quickly, um, and certainly pro the provinces in the West have seen real benefits of having that during oil spills and during flooding. I think Saskatchewan was one that had commented on that particularly. Um, and I, I registered my own farm and it took about five minutes to do. All you need is your latitude and longitude and then you know your tax bill and that's basically, there's very few other things that you actually need to provide. Um, and it's just a unique identifier and in the future it probably will be, um, it probably will be um, mandatory. So we are in the future, but it's not here now. But it is good to have one. So um, if there's any other comments on that. It's Nicole Wanamaker here. I actually have a dairy farm and registered my farm, and my horses are on a separate premise and registered them too. But, yes, it would be nice. We have a form with horses checked in the box if you have them, but um, not a lot of people have known about the form yet. So since this outbreak, I've been discussing it and trying to get people to fill out the application form. And it's free. So, yeah, free. Yeah. yeah, Melanie, it's Chrissy, and we have um, a fact sheet that's been done by the Equine Industry Development Committee around Premise ID that has gone to our communications team and will be going out through our e-blast um, e-newsletter, and it'll be on the website as well. Amazing. Okay, excellent. Thank you. Um, any other questions for, about the health and welfare update? Okay, uh, we'll move on to uh, the veterinary drug fees update. Any questions for Jean? I'll jump in again, maybe. Uh, um, uh, I must preface my remarks <laughs> that I'm a big believer in user pay, uh, but uh, I also, as a veterinarian, uh, hate to see us losing some very, very efficacious drugs. Uh, we have already have a severe limit on the medications that are available to us in Canada, and then with the new restrictions uh, crossing the border with uh, um, personal use drugs, uh, uh, there's a f further limitation, and therefore, I uh, applaud uh, the decrease from the increase down to 50%, but I think we're still going to lose a lot of drugs. So my one suggestion would be is for us to push for uh, the Canadian authorities to accept U.S. data. Uh, I don't see a big difference in our country, and I, uh, I guess unless I've got the – somebody can give me good arguments of – why we can't accept U.S. data. Has left the conference. I, I would uh, uh, suggest we push for Canadian authorities to approve any drugs that the U.S. DA approves, and then we can mm -hmm. get around this mm -hmm. uh, massive fee increase that uh, is going to hurt our industry severely, and and the bottom line, of course, hurt horse welfare um, in our treatment regimes. It's Jean. Um, just as far as that suggestion goes, one of my comments would be we accept, um, or Canada accepts U.S. data or data from other um, countries that are representative of our, of our production practice or care practices, but I think what you're meaning is we would um, recognize the decisions made in other countries relative to to even on um, manufacturing approval of manufacturing sites. So if the FDA approves a manufacturing site, then we would mutual. It's called mutual recognition in the, in the government language. So I think what we would be needing 
to be able to have the access to the same products would would be mutual recognition. Yeah, okay. I, I guess I was terming it wrong, but that's what I'd like is mutual recognition so that mm -hmm. we don't have to go through the whole process of uh, yeah, collecting the data and approving that we just rubber stamp the U.S. decision. Yeah, and then there would still be pharmacovigilance on that product. That is, is Canadian pharmacovigilance and any adverse reaction go into a periodic summary update for for that? That's basically universal that um, all regulatory agencies around the world get to review. Thank you. Okay, any other questions for Jean? If not, I apologize, but because I'm at my annual meeting, I, I, I will leave if there's no more questions. Thank you very much. Again, thank you. Bye-bye. Uh, any questions for Shauna on the question of the medication? Has left the conference. Okay. Um, and then finally for Nicole. Uh, about the strangles outbreak in the eastern in eastern Canada. Hello. Hi. Hi. This is Mickey. I'm with the Horse Welfare Alliance and also with the Canadian Animal Health Coalition. I was wondering, um, Nicole, are are you guys going to be doing up a, um, a lessons learned document? We found those are very useful. Like in the pig industry, we did one for PED last year, just not on the effects of the only the person that owns the animal, but all the other industries that are that are involved in these disease outbreaks? It's it's possible. I've not thought of that. I just kind of took the lessons together that we've learned sort of within our office here. But, um, no, it's a wonderful idea. And I, I may be able to I share something. <laughs> I might be able to share sort of the template with you. Yeah. I think that we need to start thinking about that just so that, you know, because it's, like I say, it's not just the horse owner or the stable that's affected. It's, you know, movement in and out, and it just goes you know, far, so far beyond. So exactly. I'll check into that for you. Simple. Exactly. I'd love that. That would be awesome. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, this is Wayne Burwash again. I'll jump in again. Um, I, I've got a couple of uh, points here. Um, how universal is the reporting of strangles across the country? Is no, uh, New Brunswick the only one that, has it as a reportable disease, or does anybody know that? Um, what I could find in talking with, uh, actually, Dr. Merch Kazan, I don't know if he's still on the line. Yes, I am. Because uh, you sent out that chart, remember, Keith? Yeah. That you were trying to do um, some reporting of data. So. But I can't remember whether it was actually reportable. Uh, Sorry, well, maybe, uh, I guess it isn't necessary to lose time on this, but, uh, I mean, here in Alberta, we live with strangles all the time, uh, and uh, I guess it doesn't create near as much panic as what it appears it might have done in New Brunswick if it wasn't handled properly. Um, but uh, I guess I'd like to see it more reportable across the country so we get a better feel on it but yet uh, my feeling is that I think the focus on strangles as far as uh, on a national uh, uh, front would be to focus on the biosecurity and I think mm -hmm. that's a critical thing uh, that uh, uh, we don't need to get excited about the disease per se if we've got good biosecurity uh, uh, protocol uh, set up. And I fully agree with the, the idea that uh, we need, uh, the, well, the lessons learned. But I think there's lots of protocol already published on uh, handling strangles that is available on the Internet or through the various... Uh, <clears throat> veterinary associations. So I think the biosecurity procedures are there. And so um, I, I guess I'm not sure how much we need to report in some ways. I think uh, in provinces where we deal with it all the time, it may be a little overwhelming uh, to uh, be pushing that end of the equation. Uh, I know I watch on the EDCC, and uh, I often wonder, well, why the heck is Florida got all these strangles and uh, nobody else is having them? And I understand that 
Florida is the uh, about the only state, maybe there's others, that strangles is reportable, but the vast, vast majority of states it isn't. So we don't hear from strangles or about strangles from any other states except mostly Florida, or at least as far as I remember. So again, yeah. uh, it uh, kind of uh, uh, slants the data that it's uh, very severe in one area, but maybe not occurring in other areas. So I I'm not sure what we do to proceed here, um, whether we need to be reporting it uh, across the country or whether, uh, like I say, I think in my mind anyhow, uh, it's probably a lot better to really focus on the promotion of biosecurity and vaccinations uh, to uh, uh, prevent the disease from uh, rearing its ugly head. It's uh, Keith here, Wayne, and uh, it's only annually notifiable for the CFIA and also the province of Ontario. Those are the only ones that... Uh, so <coughs> if it's... Uh, so all provinces have to report it annually to CFIA. With their cases, oh. But really, but really it's you know, it's kind of late when yeah. you hear it uh, when you get it reported um, annually. So there's essentially no problem is to have it immediately notifiable. The only thing I can see is that maybe just letting everybody know that it's in the backyard of their province. Like you, for out west, I guess it's it's quite common, but here in the Maritimes, it's not as common, at least in New Brunswick. So... It was just important for me, I know, to get the communication out there that, you know, we have it. So, and then biosecurity, of course, as you say, Wayne, is the most important thing to do, really. Okay, thank you very much. Are there any other questions for Nicole? I had a question about the EIA. I know I'm circling back, but uh, yeah. I've been busy here at work. <laughs> Um, I was wondering with uh, the CFIA putting out that kind of questionnaire and these new phase one policies, um, if it does get struck down by the non-testers, is Equine Canada still going to be promoting testing and kind of pushing testing onto the provinces? Because uh, the staff one here is just very lax because the non-testers outweigh the testers. So, sorry, when you say there's a question in Canada pushing testing, what do you mean by that? Like advocating for testing of EIA. Um, so it is, from my perspective as a chair, or co-chair of the committee, um, and from my understanding, it has always been in question in Canada's position that it's the best practice to test for EIA yeah. um, mm -hmm. when there's movement, when there's sale of a horse, or when you're attending a place where there may be higher risk. Or if you are, um, or if you're attending uh, an event where there may be commingling of horses, um, so it has always been that that's always the position of Western Canada. Some provinces like Saskatchewan have gone to testing for all sanctioned shows within the province. Not anymore. Have, oh, that they, got struck down. Oh, trust um, me, that, this was a hot topic yeah. two years ago, and it tore our province apart. Yeah, and we've had that debate a, a great deal uh, on the committee about whether or not uh, Equestrian Canada should mandate testing for all horses that Equestrian Canada station shows. Um, yeah. And as, as yet, we have not come to consensus on that. Okay. Um, well, I guess as long as it stays on the books and the four mine, because I've got some pretty talented horses and I can't go anywhere because it's so common here in my province now. Now it's just like, oh, EIA, oh, EIA, right? And it's very frustrating. Yeah. Now I have yeah. to go to Alberta to go show. And I've left the conference. I can't afford that right now. So it would be nice if it was some form of mandatory. Yeah, if someone's got a lot of background noise, so if you're not speaking, if you could mute your line by pressing star six, that would be great. Um, 
So, yeah, I mean, I think it's a great point of discussion, and we would definitely welcome on Equestrian Canada, um, we would welcome any comments that you may have on that if, you're a, if you feel like it's a worthwhile endeavor to do. Um, I guess, to be honest with you, we have, we've had opposing views on the committee, and we haven't been able to, as I say, come to consensus on whether or not mm -hmm. we should enforce it, like, you know, it, you know yeah. add that on as a requirement, the concern always being that is it going to be uh, considered um, overly onerous and expensive for people? Is it, or is it, you know, is it the right thing to do for, for disease control? Um, there really, there are really opposing views. So we would welcome any comments on that. Okay. And if anybody wants to email me their comments, then I can make sure that they all stay together and the committee has a chance to see them. Great. Okay. Um, do then. Are there any other questions um, for any of the speakers before we conclude? Okay, well, with that, um, I'm going to close the line off, and we will post this as soon as possible, and there will be a notification sent out about the next call, which is uh, the first Wednesday of the month um, at 12 o'clock Eastern Standard Time. Has left Thanks for the joining conference. us today.